Hi. Today we're going to talk about Chapter 11 in uh, Lewis Vaughn's uh, Power of Critical Thinking. This one is called Judging Scientific Theories. I'm going to talk a little bit, little bit about what makes science science and how we work on understanding all those theories and what we need to do with all those theories. So our, here's what we're going to walk through. <laughs> I know it's a lot. Um, science and not science, seven warning signs of bogus science, the scientific method, testing scientific theories, um, placebos and double blinds and all that. Judging scientific theories using the um, criteria of adequacy, some examples there. Science and weird theories, um, why should we care, why, why we do those things, and then how to judge them. Okay, that's chapter 11. Um, it's not nearly as complex as some of the other ones, so we might not take as long today. Um, I want to make sure you know, for the test, these are your two big word definitions. Okay, They're not in the glossary this time. They are in the chapter, but he talks about science a lot, and so um, you want to make sure you're getting the right one if you want the points on the test. So, science is an extremely reliable way of acquiring knowledge about the empirical world. Um, and that's on page 405. The scientific method has five steps. Okay, this is what you need to put on your test. First, identify the problem or pose a question. Second, devise a hypothesis to explain the event or phenomenon. Three, derive a test implication or prediction. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, four, perform the test. Five, accept or reject or revise the hypothesis. Um, and remember that in the middle of this, you know, you're doing some of the stuff from the COA, um, but you're mostly, this is the scientific method as it's been presented since eh, the late 1700s. So, there you go. Okay. Um, in Chapter 11, on page 403, um, we have a lot of things about science here. Um, the little... The quote in the um, margin by Bertolt Breck, um, the aim of science is not to open the door to infinite wisdom, but to set a limit to infinite error. Um, how far can we go? Well, if we're talking about science, you know, we have, we have parameters. Um, science seeks to acquire knowledge and understanding of reality, and it does so through the formulation, testing, and evaluation of theories. When this kind of search for answers is both systematic and careful, science is being done. Sounds a lot like our definition for critical thinking. Okay, It's formulated, it's tested, it's put through the ropes, right? It's systematic, it's careful. Um, we need to make sure if we're going to claim something is true, that it actually is. Okay, um, And so we have to know what science isn't. Okay, Science is not technology. Okay. Um, science pursues knowledge, technology makes things, okay? And while science is used in the making of technology, it's not the same thing as tech. Um, science is not ideology. Um, an ideology is a way of thinking about things. We also call this a worldview sometimes. Um, science is not ideology. We can't identify science with a particular worldview. Um, Lots of different scientists have lots of different worldviews, and so it's difficult to kind of smush that down without making it totally nonsensical. Okay, so science is a way of looking for the truth, but it is not the truth in and of itself. Okay, and science is not scientism. Scientism, that ism at the end there, um, says that science is the only way. Okay. Um, it is an extremely reliable way of acquiring knowledge about the empirical world. Now, it can't tell us things about faith or about the spiritual world, and to confuse that is, is also things that happen all the time, right? Um, one thing also about science, it is self-correcting. Um, which means because we go through and we retest theories and we add information to them and we retest them again, um, we're self-correcting. We didn't know 100 years ago um, about, you know, wireless technology. 
Who would ever think that that would be possible? Um, now we take it for granted. It's in all the rooms we inhabit. It's you know in our house and our and our work and school and everything. And so we have different ideas. Um, it is extremely reliable. And so there are seven warning signs of bogus science here on page 404 and 405. Um, one is the discoverer pitches the claim directly to the media or makes an infomercial. Why not? Um, the discoverer says that a powerful establishment is trying to suppress his or her work. Um, I'm the only one who knows this and I'm the only one who can tell you this. Really, in our current day and age, um, we have, you know, 8 billion people, but we also have, you know, hundreds of thousands of people doing science and research. Um, the chance that you are the only person who knows this is pretty slim. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, the scientific effect involved is always at the very limit of detection. Okay, there is never a clear photograph, say, of the Loch Ness Monster or Sasquatch or whatever. Um, and parapsychology, um, things like telepathy, psychokinesis, that kind of stuff. Um, it's hard to get a good, accurate picture of that. Um, the evidence for the discovery is anecdotal, um, which means it's particular to certain people's stories, but it doesn't, it's not replicatable, and that's a big deal for science, okay? The discoverer says a belief is credible because it has endured for centuries. Um, there has been, you know, all the way back to Hippocrates and all those folks about the blood circulates through the body. We've known that. Now, capillaries were kind of the end of that. The discoverer has worked in isolation. The discoverer must propose new laws of nature to explain an observation. Remember that whole simplicity thing. If we have to add assumptions to our head in order for this to work, it's probably not true. Okay? So, read that, read that, read that. Um, the scientific method um, it's, it's hard to point to a single spot where this was, you know, this is our scientific method. No, this is just how we do science. And so we have to kind of look at it. Identifying the problem, posing a question, going through and searching. Okay. This logic of hypothesis testing works like this. And this is on page 407. Um, if, and this is where we get the test implication part, okay? So if we're trying to figure out, okay, does this work? So we're going to say, here's my, I have to make sure I'm doing this correctly because you know, the hypothesis, okay? If my hypothesis is correct, then this consequent will happen, if H then C, okay? Well, I, I run my test and no C. So, not H. Okay. Now, we know that this is a most tolens. This is a valid argument. Okay. Now, we are not talking about, usually, deductive here. Okay. This is a deductive argument. Okay. Does it work? Hmm. Okay. H is, would be proven false even if only one of several consequences turned out to be false. Okay, so if our hypothesis is correct, then we get this consequence. We didn't get the consequence, so our hypothesis is not correct. Okay, and this is good because it's valid. Now, we have to make sure that hypothesis and causes are true, right? Now, if we have the whole if H then conclusion, if my hypothesis is true, then this conclusion is true. And yay, the conclusion is true. So H. But this is an invalid argument. Okay, this is affirming the consequent. We know from chapters three and chapter six, not, not six, seven, that this is an invalid argument. 
So we can never say 100% that my hypothesis is true because I have an invalid argument. It's probably true. Okay, that's where we get away with things. Okay, so. Um, take the little quiz on are you scientifically literate? Um, and I would say all but number nine are pretty fun to do. Number nine, it depends upon what you have. Yep. So, um, no hypothesis can ever be conclusively confirmed, nor can it be conclusively confuted. Okay? I can't say no, and I can't say yes 100%. That's why we are in the realm of inductive. probably true. We can say if we get this answer, it's probably true. If we get this answer, it's probably not true. Okay, so we can't be absolutely sure because it's a hypothesis. Okay, even if my hypothesis is true and my conclusions are true and my consequences are true, it's only probable. Okay, when we are talking about testing scientific theories. Um, there's a particular way that we go about, especially in medical testing or scientific testing. Um, we have something that is called a placebo effect. Um, and basically what this is, is um, in order to find out if a particular um, treatment works, okay, um, we run computer models and see how things go. We run um, sometimes we do um, lab testing um, on tissue samples and things like that. Sometimes we use um, mice, um, which are remarkably like us, which is really kind of funny. Um, but to see how, you know, their pancreas works or their, you know, with these different things. So if my treatment cures the diabetic mice, it might cure humans. That's how it works. Um, the placebo effect um, is something that we've all experienced. Um, you've been feeling lousy, it's horrible, you take some medicine, and within five minutes you're starting to feel a little better. Um, well, unless that's an aerosol, it's probably not what's affecting you. You've taken medication, you have hope that you will feel better. Okay, the placebo effect. Um, and the way this works in scientific testing is that the placebo effect can mimic the actual effect of medicine. And so when we're doing an actual test, we want to do something that's called double blind, okay? Which just means that the people who are taking the medicine, those in the, in the target group, and those that are not taking the medicine, they're taking the placebo, um, don't know which one they have. Um, and neither do the folks who are kind of running the test. Um, it's been randomized, it's been put out that way. And this seems, especially when you're talking about you know, cancer treatments and things like that, it seems kind of mean. Um, you're getting medicine, but you're not getting medicine. And yes and no. Um, having been a member of um, an early sci uh, medical trial, it's Part of what you have to be thinking as a patient in that is that this is going to help maybe not me, but it's going to help people down the road. Um, and you want to do your best job. And so do the, the people who are doing the testing and all that, running the test. Um, sometimes those tests are run completely sanitary. Um, some of those you get to go home. Um, some is a little bit of both. It depends upon how it works. But these double blind tests are really the only way to get at, does this actually work? We as humans tend to hope, and our hope gets us into trouble sometimes when it comes to medical, um, because we can respond a certain way um, that muddies the water when it comes to actually figuring out whether or not this treatment is a good one. Um, and so the other piece of that there are ways to look for causes and for cures, excuse me, that don't require 
people actually taking medicine. Um, it's called a non-intervention or a population study. And you've seen this, um, especially if you're um, looking at different ways of um, improving your diet, you know, to um, improve your health. Lots of things have been written about what's the best thing to eat or what are the best ways to go about it. And um, they can be helpful and they can be hurtful, um, depending upon how, how seriously people take certain things. But the idea here, um, if you look at people in populations who tend to live longer lives with better health, um, we want to know what's their secret, right? So they're already doing the good stuff, right? They're already winning. And so we want to see why they're winning. And um, the Mediterranean diet, um, there's um, the Okinawa diet, different places in the world who have high concentrations of people who live to be above 80 who are still healthy at 80. Um, none of us wants to live um, 120 years if the last 40 of those are bedridden and sick. Okay, um, But if we can live to 100 and still be doing things, that's amazing, so how they do it. Okay, so they, this non-intervention study looks at the population and says, oh, well, they have a high um, incidence of eating raw and or cooked vegetables. Okay, so be a vegetarian. Um, doesn't work for everybody. They do this and they walk miles and miles every day and they do these other things. And so we know certain things tend to keep one in better health than others. Okay, the standard American diet um, doesn't tend to keep people healthy for years and years. Okay. Um, judging scientific theories, bottom of page 412, we have um, all kinds of good possibilities here. Um, scientific theories, we're using the COA, testability, fruitfulness, scope, simplicity, conservatism. And um, Dr. Vaughn's going to take us through um, Copernicus versus Ptolemy. Um, is our universe, is our solar system, um, the fact we call it a solar system now, um, is it Earth-centric or is it heliocentric? Is it Sun-centric? Well, we know um, that the, the, the universe does not revolve around Earth. Um, the universe doesn't even revolve around our Sun, but our solar system does and how it works. And Copernicus um, worked through a lot of this, and there were still a, little, a couple of little baubles, but when we got better telescopes, we figured out, oh, he really was right. Um, Galileo was helpful with that. And then we walk through a few pages on creationism versus um, evolution. Um, living organisms adapt to their environments through inherited characteristics, which results in changes in succeeding generations. Okay, so um, things about the fossil record and this big piece here on the clash over intelligent design. So, we have scientific theories that back up both sides of this argument. How well do they do that? Well, it depends. Then we have chapter 11 exercises 1 through 6, and then we're going to talk about weird theories. Okay, weird versus mundane. Okay, so... Weird theories are what people will call supernatural, parapsychology, I don't know how to make that into the right word, parapsychological, wow, that's a big word. Okay, they're not things that we would normally be able to see or feel or touch, okay? And like I said before, Science is good and wonderful for our empirical knowledge, empirical things we can feel, touch, taste, all those things. Um, but 
not so much the bizarre stuff. Okay, we're interested, but it's you know. Um, and so we're like, okay, so if I'm talking the difference between science and weird theories, why should I care? Okay, why do I care if somebody thinks that um, they've been abducted by aliens and subjected to tests? Well, for one thing, they are widely believed, um, so they're often difficult to ignore. They are heavily promoted in countless TV programs, movies, books, magazines, tabloids, and like claims in politics, medicine, and many other fields, they can dramatically affect people's lives, for better or worse. So it's good for us to understand that we can subject them to the same kinds of criteria that we subject any other theory to, okay, and see how they do. Now, we tend to make some mistakes when we're dealing with weird theories, okay? Um, when confronted with a phenomenon that we don't understand, the most reasonable response is to search for natural explanation. We tend to leap to the weirdest thing, okay? If we're talking about something like crop circles, and he goes into a lot of detail on that, you'll love that part. Um, if we're talking about crop circles, they are complex in some cases, very interesting, beautiful, weird, whatever. Um, and so we think, ah, oh, aliens. Well, not so much. Um, and there's one in here. I was a crop circle baker or whatever. Anyway, it's very fun. Um, sometimes we mix, we mix up what seems with what actually is. Um, hallucinations and things are, you know, interesting, happens to more people than we know. Um, just because something seems real doesn't mean that it is. And also, we can misunderstand the logical possibility and physical possibility. We can put together lots of things in a little syllogism and it works, it's valid. It's not true at all. And that's possible. And we've seen that throughout the book, right? We've seen that. So how do we judge them? Well, we do the same thing that we did for the test theory. State the theory, check for consistency, assess the evidence, scrutinize alternative theories, test the theories with the criteria of adequacy, figure out who wins, okay? And then we get into the crop circles. It's amazing stuff. Um, the crop circle prankster on page 435. And then we have to remember one of the things about weird theories is people can believe they've seen something, UFO, um, aliens, um, whatever. Um, people who can use telekinesis and clairvoyance and clairaudience and all those kind of things. Um, we have the evidence of their personal testimony, their eyewitness testimony. But we know that eyewitness testimony is problematic. Right? Our brains make sense of things for us. And sometimes that making sense of things doesn't have anything to do with what actually happened. And so we have to be careful. Um, and then he walks through uh, an explanation on psychic phenomenon, um, talking with the dead, palm readings, psychic readings, um, cold readings, things like that. And you have to go through and use the criteria of adequacy. Okay? And then we have some more explanations and exercises, okay? Make sure when you're walking through um, chapter 11, and I know this is a shorter video, of course, but you need to walk through the examples that he gives in the book. Um, they are phenomenal, and they, they show everything very, very Clearly, um, if you don't read through those, you're going to miss a lot of opportunity to understand how science works, how this working the theories works. Um, and I think you'll enjoy some of his um, examples and stuff in there as well. Um, crop circles and you know, palm reading kind of out there kind of stuff. And so we need to think about how do we deal with our day-to-day -day 
weird stuff, okay? Um, visual distortions and, you know, it's so easy to doctor photos and videos and things like that anymore that you have to take everything with a grain of salt, okay? So take everything and make sure that you run it through that criteria of adequacy. Is it consistent? Does it meet the things that I know are true? Um, do I have to add stuff to my head? Um, all of those things are very important to think about, especially if we're going to use these ideas to make considerations about how we're going to live our lives, okay, or how we're going to judge how other people live their lives, because um, that's a whole other can of worms, right? So work through Chapter 11. Make sure that you understand things before we get to the test, and if you have questions, you know how to get above me. You have my email.